Colon cancer cases are exploding, especially in young people. And what's devastating about this is colon cancer is one of the most preventable cancers, if not the most preventable cancer out of all of them. So in this video, I wanna go over actionable and evidence-based steps that you can start today to help prevent colon cancer in the future. So what we're gonna talk about is optimizing your calcium and optimizing your vitamin D. And we're also gonna talk about the best fiber you need to incorporate into your diet to reduce that risk of colon cancer. And then we'll need to talk about red meat and processed meat and how you should approach those. And spoiler alert, you do not have to cut out red meat altogether to do this. Okay, so one thing you can start today is to make sure you optimize your calcium and your vitamin D. And this is important because it's estimated that approximately 42% of adults in the US are deficient in vitamin D. And we have case control studies that show an inverse correlation between serum levels of vitamin D and the incidence of polyps in the colon. Meaning the lower the level of vitamin D in your body, the higher the likelihood of having colon polyps. And we have this meta-analysis of 35 observational studies that also showed a consistent and inverse relationship between serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels and colorectal cancer. Meaning that the lower your vitamin D level, the higher the risk of developing colorectal cancer. And we also have early epidemiological studies, as well as a Mendelian randomization study that found that people living at southern latitudes, where levels of sunlight exposure are relatively high, were less likely to develop or die from certain cancers when compared to people living at northern latitudes. And some researchers speculate that it's the sun exposure that leads to the production of vitamin D in the skin that may account for those variations. And then there were studies like this pulled analysis that showed that there was a higher likelihood of having colorectal adenomas or precursors to colon cancer with vitamin D levels less than 30. And there's mounting evidence that helps explain this relationship between vitamin D and cancer. And as one example of that, some people have a variation of a vitamin D receptor in their body called the BSML polymorphism that has been associated consistently with colon cancer. And on top of that, vitamin D may directly or indirectly regulate up to three to 5% of the human genome. So vitamin D ends up playing a role in a wide spectrum of anti-cancer activities. And it's evolved in almost every cell of normal and abnormal cell functioning. And if it's abnormal, this is what leads to cancer. So vitamin D affects things like cell proliferation and differentiation, and it affects inflammation, and it also regulates a process called apoptosis or cell death, where cancerous cells are destroyed. Now, one important caveat we have to consider is a lot of this is based on mechanistic data and epidemiological or observational data, which can only show an association. But as I often talk about in my videos, association does not mean causation. And in cases like these, we have to account for the healthy user bias. So for instance, people that had higher levels of vitamin D, was it the vitamin D or was it something else that caused them to have less colon cancer? Was it the sunlight or was it better access to healthcare? Or is it different types of food that grows better in Southern latitudes? So to answer these questions, it's always more helpful to look at randomized control trials. And the largest trial we have for vitamin D supplementation is called the VITAL trial. And this trial looked at more than 25,000 participants and noted that the group that was taking 2,000 international units of vitamin D for five years actually had the same overall cancer incidence as the placebo group. And there was another large study that was a randomized double-blind placebo control trial from New Zealand. And this study also showed that high dose supplementation of vitamin D may not prevent cancer. So how do you synthesize all of this together? Why do we see such a strong correlation in observational data? But why don't we see it in these randomized control trials? Does vitamin D actually help with prevention of cancer and specifically colorectal cancer? Well, looking at the totality of the evidence that's available, which kind of paints a muddy picture, but I believe the benefits are still there. And here's why. The problem with a lot of these studies is what they do, they look at the doses of vitamin D given, or they look at the initial levels of vitamin D. But what they often don't assess is the optimal levels of vitamin D, or whether people taking vitamin D supplementation are actually able to achieve optimal levels. And when I say optimal levels, I mean optimal levels for their individual health, because it may be different from person to person. Someone may be taking whopping amounts of vitamin D, but if they never get to their optimal level, 
well then it doesn't really matter if they're taking vitamin D. Or what if you're taking vitamin D, but your body lacks the magnesium to help activate vitamin D into a form that can actually be used by your body. And this is important because it's estimated that more than half of Americans are not getting enough magnesium. So the take home message is based on all the studies that we have, it's not as clear as I'd like it to be, but the association between low magnesium and increasing rates of colon cancer is too strong to ignore. And because getting vitamin D levels right is so important, not just for cancer prevention, but for your immune function and your brain health and anti-aging benefits, I would definitely keep an eye on your vitamin D levels. And in most of my patients, I recommend them to try to get their vitamin D levels to at least a 40 to 60 nanogram per milliliter range. Now, this is not a blanket advice and your situation may be different, so talk to your doctor about what your individual goal should be. And if you are currently taking a vitamin D supplement, I would encourage you to check your vitamin D levels pretty frequently, as it's not about how much you take, but it's all about trying to get to your optimal range. Because there is such a thing as taking too much vitamin D, and we definitely don't want to overdo it, because too high of levels of vitamin D can lead to too much calcium in the blood and it can lead to kidney stones and a whole host of other problems. And speaking of calcium, this is another thing that we have to get right when it comes to colon cancer prevention. So there was an older study that was a 19-year prospective cohort study that observed an approximately 70% lower risk of colorectal cancer between the highest and the lowest quartiles of calcium intake. And then there's randomized control trials like this one that showed that calcium supplementation is associated with a significant, though moderate, reduction in the risk of recurrent colorectal adenomas. And the protective effect that we see with calcium is likely because calcium helps with the integrity of the intestinal barrier and it helps with the regulation of gut microbiome. So when it comes to calcium, the predominant evidence shows an increase in colorectal cancer risk in individuals who consume less than 700 to 1000 milligrams per day. So I would just make sure that you get at least that much from your food, but I would definitely discuss this with your doctor as too high levels of calcium have been linked or associated with worsening heart disease. Okay, next. This is probably one of the most studied and one of the most effective tools we have in prevention of colon cancer, and that is getting the right fiber. And there was a large meta-analysis published in the Lancet Journal in 2019, and the study looked at 185 prospective studies and 58 clinical trials, and it showed that eating a fiber-rich diet reduced the incidence of colorectal cancer as well as heart disease and strokes and diabetes by 16 to 24%. And in fact, for every eight gram increase in daily fiber consumption, there was a five to 27% decrease in total deaths and instances of heart disease and diabetes and colorectal cancer. Now, not all fiber is the same, so we have to know which fiber specifically helps protect against colon cancer. So with fiber, there's basically two main types of fiber that we need to know. And it's the soluble fiber, which dissolves in water and forms a gel-like substance in your gut. And then there's insoluble fiber, which basically just adds bulk and it helps move food through the digestive tract. And for colon cancer prevention, we need the right combination of both. So with soluble fiber, they're fermentable, meaning your gut bacteria can digest them. And in the process, they produce short chain fatty acids like butyrate as a byproduct. And butyrate is extremely important when it comes to colon health. It can fuel colon cells and butyrate strengthens the gut barrier and it helps repair colon cell damage. And butyrate also turns off genes that promote inflammation and uncontrolled cell growth. So it basically can stop early cancers in its tracks. And on top of that, butyrate also lowers the pH of your colon or it makes the colon more acidic, which limits the growth of harmful bacteria or bacteria that can turn bile acids and dietary fats into carcinogens. And the best butyrate producing fibers that you want to make sure you incorporate into your diet would be inulin, which you find in things like onions and garlic and asparagus. And then you also need a separate type of fiber called pectin, which you can find in apples and citrus fruits and carrots. And then you also want to incorporate things like beta-glucans, which you can find in oats and barley. 
And of course, don't forget about lentils and beans. Now, when it comes to insoluble fibers, which is the fiber that you get from your regular salad vegetables or your whole grains and nuts and seeds, these fibers help you move waste products through the colon more quickly and it helps you reduce your colon exposure to carcinogens. And there is a systematic review and meta-analysis from 2022 that showed that both soluble and insoluble fiber consumption appear to be protective against colorectal cancer. And the relationship between the colon cancer risk and fiber intake is equal between soluble and insoluble fiber. So I would recommend for everyone to get at least 30 grams of fiber per day and more is probably better. And I would encourage you to get your fiber from a wide variety of sources. Okay, next let's talk about red meat and processed meat. So the World Health Organization has classified processed meat as a group one carcinogen, meaning there's strong evidence that processed meat can cause cancer. And in fact, each 50 gram portion of processed meat eaten daily increases the risk of colorectal cancer by 18%. But once again, this is based on observational data. So we could be looking at association, but not causation. So it's hard to definitively say red meat or processed meat causes cancer, but that association data is pretty strong and at this point, I would not ignore it. Because mechanistically, it is completely plausible for red meat or processed meat to cause cancer. And that is because processed meats like bacon and sausage and hot dogs contain nitrites and nitrates. And when they enter your gut and your colon, they form a known carcinogen called nitrosamine. Or another name for those is N-nitrodimethylamine or NDMA, which is once again, a known carcinogen and it is known to damage your DNA, which is the first step for cancer formation. So does that mean you cannot eat red meat or bacon or sausage? Absolutely not, but I would do it in moderation and I would always pair your red meat with high amounts of fiber because as we discussed, fiber is protective. And in fact, there's some fascinating studies like this one that show us that you can negate the potential harmful effects of red meat or processed meat by getting enough fiber. So in this study, they found that eating 300 grams of red meat per day for four weeks increased the levels of a biomarker that's linked to cancer development by 30%. But consuming 40 grams of butyrate resistant starch along with the red meat completely negated that increase and brought the levels of that cancer biomarker down to baseline levels. So if you do eat red meat, I would also make sure you're also eating fiber and especially resistant starch fiber. So it'd be things like cool potatoes or cool rice and whole grains, as well as green bananas. Next, an extremely important strategy that will help you lower the risk of cancer is movement and exercise. In fact, we have research that shows that physical activity may prevent 15% of colon cancers. And there's recent studies like this one that show the combination of vitamin D and omega-3 fatty acids in a simple home exercise program showed a cumulative reduction in colon cancer by 61%, which totally makes sense because exercise reduces inflammation and improves your immune function. And as we're finding out, it's the excessive inflammation and it's the poor immune function status is what leads to cancer development. And exercise is great, not just for the prevention of cancer, but it's an incredibly powerful treatment for those already diagnosed with colon cancer and those who are in remission. In fact, there was a recent study that was just published in the New England Journal of Medicine that was a randomized controlled trial that included almost 900 patients from six different countries. And it's patients that are recovering from stage two or stage three colon cancer. And the group that was randomized to a structured three-year exercise prescription reduced the risk of death by 37% and reduced the risk of cancer recurrence or new cancer by 28%. And it wasn't particularly strenuous or time-consuming exercise either. The exercise group were just doing the equivalent of about 1.5 to 2.25 extra hours of risk walking per week. Now, one thing that we haven't talked about, but it's probably one of the most important things that you can do to prevent colon cancer is to recognize the danger signs early. And you need to be aggressive in your screening for colon cancer before it becomes an issue. But I made a separate video on that earlier, so you can find that over here. All right, I hope this was helpful. Stay healthy and I'll see you in the next one.